The Heightened Mind, 3. Damatalks. A John Lee Damadero. Feeding the Mind. August 10, 1957. When water is subjected to the heat of the sun or the heat of a fire to the point where it has evaporated away. Leaving just the dry kettle or pot, can you say that that's the end of the water? Actually, it still exists, simply that the heat has turned it into a vapor that has dispersed into the air. So you can't say that the water no longer exists. It still exists somewhere else in another condition. The same holds true with the mind. When the body dies, the mind doesn't die along with it. It simply moves to a new place in line with your good or bad kama. The fact that it still exists in another condition, that's what we mean when we say that it doesn't die. Still, when it's subjected to a lot of fire, it degenerates. Just like the body, when the body is subjected to the fires of aging, illness, and death, it degenerates. When the mind is subjected to the fires of defilement passion, aversion, and delusion it degenerates. The more these three masses of flame burn away at the mind, the more it degenerates in terms of its goodness. It's because we have fire burning the body and the mind from both sides, that they end up having to fall apart and going their separate directions. This we call the process of birth and death. So if you want happiness, you have to train the heart to get rid of its defilements. Only then will you be done with birth and death. But if you were to ask where that place of no birth and no death is located, it would be hard to point out. Just like pointing at an albino elephant or water buffalo to get a blind person to look at it, it would be a waste of effort. In the same way, describing the place of no birth and no death so that an ignorant person would understand it is a waste of time. Only when you develop discernment will you understand where people go after they die, and whether or not there's really a place of no birth and no death. This is because a person of discernment has an inner eye the A with Makron Akaku, or Eye of Knowledge. What this means is that he or she has seen the true Dhamma. That's what gives such a person the ability to understand this issue. The Buddha said, whoever sees the Dhamma sees me. In other words, when we see the Dhamma that doesn't die, we'll be able to see those who don't die, what it is that doesn't die. So when we reach the Dhamma that doesn't die, we meet with the place that doesn't die. As long as we haven't met with that place, we have to keep practicing so as to give rise to the eye of the mind. The problem is that even though most of us have clear eyesight, our minds are still dark and blurry. The Dhamma of the Buddha that we're taught every day is like a lens for casting some light into the eye of the mind, so that we can feel our way along without falling into pits or wells. Even then, though, our minds are still blurry. This is why we have so many differing opinions, our eyes are still blurry but at least we're not blind. We can still see vague shapes and shadows. There's a saying, Samaka Dasana Etam Magalamadama. Seeing a contemplative is the highest blessing. What this means is that whoever sees a noble one a stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, or arahant sees a grand auspicious sight. But you really have to see a genuine noble one for this to be true. So where are you going to look for a noble one? What sorts of features help you recognize a noble one? If you look at a noble one from the outside, there's no way you can know for sure. The only way to know for sure is to practice the Dhamma so as to give rise to the qualities of a noble one within yourself. As long as you don't have those qualities within you, you can't see a genuine noble one. Your eyes are still blurry, so everything you see is blurry. Your mind is an ordinary mind, so everywhere you look, all you can see are ordinary people. To help us see the truth in this way, the Buddha teaches three guidelines for practice. 1. Matatsya Bhattasmai having a sense of moderation in consuming food. 2. Pantanksasayans in a delighting in seclusion. 3. Adhisitsya Yago being committed to the heightened mind, i.e. heightening the happiness of the mind. With regard to the first guideline having a sense of moderation in consuming food there are two kinds of consumption, consuming food for the body and consuming food for the mind. Two sorts of food for the body should be avoided, anything that's been obtained through bad kama, and anything that doesn't really nourish the body. When you avoid these two sorts of food, 
that's called having a sense of moderation in consuming food. As for food for the mind, there are three kinds. 1. Fostra, the food of sensory contact, i.e., the contact of sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, and ideas as they strike against the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. 2. Vera, the food of consciousness, i.e., awareness at the six sense doors, and 3. Manosasatanra, the food of mental intentions, i.e., setting the mind on an object. A person without a sense of moderation in food is like an ill person who doesn't know what foods will aggravate his illness. He's bound to have a short life and an early death. Not only that, he also creates burdens for the people around him, his parents, spouse, children, and relatives. They're put to all sorts of trouble. When he dies, they have to find the money to pay for the funeral and make merit to dedicate to him. Before he dies, they have to pay for medical care. The doctors and nurses have to look after him until way late into the night, giving him medicine, cleaning up his urine and feces, all kinds of things. But if you gain a sense of how to look after yourself and are careful about how you consume your food, you'll have few diseases. You yourself will be at ease, and the people around you won't be burdened. The five hindrances are like germs. If they get established in your heart, they'll multiply and spread and eat away at your heart continually. To the point where your mind falls to such a low level that you can't lift it up again. The food of consciousness means the consciousness at the six sense doors that arises when sights strike the eyes, sounds strike the ears, and so forth. Pleasing sights are like sugar, molasses, or honey, which are sure to be teeming with ants, gnats, and flies. Disagreeable sights are like filth, in addition to carrying germs, they're sure to attract all sorts of other bad things, too, because they're crawling with flies and worms. If we don't notice the ants, flies, and filth, we'll go ahead and eat the food and it will be toxic to our health. Like a person without any teeth who finds chicken bones in his food, he can't chew them, so he tries to swallow them whole and ends up with his eyes bulging out of their sockets. If you aren't discerning, you'll gobble down the filth together with the worms and smelly parts, and the sugar together with the ants and flies. So you have to pay careful attention. Before you eat, look to see what you can handle and what you can't, what you have to be wary of and what you don't. This is called having a knife and a chopping board for your food. When you examine things for yourself in this way, you'll get to eat food that's well prepared and cooked not like a monster that eats things raw. If you don't examine things, you'll misunderstand what's happening, thinking that good things are bad, and bad things are good. The mind won't be clear about these things because you lack mindfulness and discernment. You'll swallow toxic food right into your heart. This is called being very greedy, very deluded, because you're careless in your eating, and this creates hazards for your heart. The same holds true with the food of ear consciousness. The sounds you like are like sugar or delicious sweets. The sounds you don't like are food that's rotten and spoiled. If you don't use discernment, don't use restraint, and don't pay proper attention, you'll end up eating food that's all rotten and wormy. Whatever sweet you'll swallow down whole, and all the ants, worms, and flies will go down with it. This will cause pain and trouble for your intestines, and turmoil for your heart. Your heart is already in poor health, and yet you go gobbling down things that are toxic. When this happens, no one can cure you but you yourself. The same thing applies in the area of the nose, tongue, body, and mind. Whatever food you plan to swallow, you first have to pay careful attention, as monks do when they chant the passage for reflection before using any of the four requisites. At the same time, we have to reflect on whether the person bringing us these things suffers from wrong views and practices wrong livelihood as well. Otherwise, our own virtues will be compromised. So we have to be firmly intent, using mindfulness to gain evidence, and our discernment to pass judgment. That way we'll get to eat food that's just and fair. Anyone who doesn't use mindfulness and discernment is like an ogre that eats dead things, rotten things, and raw bones, 
wings, skins, and feathers, everything you swallow right down, like a savage who doesn't know any better. Scientists nowadays are smart. They can take things you normally couldn't eat and then distill and process them so that you can eat them, and they're good for you, too. People without discernment, who allow themselves to get overcome with greed and hunger, will eat everything, wings, tails, bones, fins. The things they like get stuck in their hearts. The things they don't like get stuck in their hearts. Wherever they go, it's as if they have bones stuck in their throats. But if we have virtue, concentration, and discernment in our consumption of the food of consciousness, it's as if we have a fire, a stove, and a knife to prepare our food the right way. The next kind of food is the food of mental intentions. If we set our hearts on the wrong things, it can be toxic to us. If you sit here thinking about someone you hate or who makes you angry, telling yourself that if you meet that person you'll have to say this or that, this is called setting your heart on the wrong object. If you set your heart on the right things, it will flow in the right direction. Forgetfulness and delusion won't be able to arise. For instance, you can think about the virtues or the generosity you've practiced, or about your teachers. This is called setting your heart on the right object. The heart will begin to blossom. Just like the people in the time of the Buddha, when their hearts were inclined toward recollection of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Saga, they entered the refuge of the noble attainments. For this reason, we should incline our hearts toward the people or things that will cause our hearts to flourish and grow. This is what will give them the strength they need to gain release from the hindrances, which are like curtains of fog, or like worms that swarm over and eat away at the heart. This is what will give us the strength to shoot our way up to the paths and fruitions leading to Nibna. In this way we'll be good cooks for ourselves. But if we don't know how to chop, boil, or fry our own food, we'll have to eat it raw, just like a monster. The third mouthful of food is the food of contact. Whatever sights come in by way of the eyes, whatever sounds come in by way of the ears, whatever smells comes in by way of the nose, and so forth, you have to be careful. Pay attention at all times to whatever will be of use, and avoid anything poisonous. Whatever will be meritorious or skillful, even if it may be painful, you have to endure and stick with it, as when you have to endure heat, cold, or rain in the practice. As for anything that will be unskillful, you have to shake it right off. The same applies to the ideas that make contact in the mind. When you can act in this way, good food will keep flowing in to benefit your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, and will seep in to bathe your heart. You'll be secluded from evil, secluded from defilements. At Hisitsia Yago, you'll be committed to the heightened mind. Mind states heading to the level of the lower realms will disappear, and those of the noble ones will arise in their place. The mind will be in a firm steady state, heading straight for Nibna. That's how it gets beyond the reach of the fires that burn at the end of the Ian. Genuine Practice, Genuine Knowing August 30, 1958 When you're sitting in concentration, don't think that you're sitting here in this meditation hall. Tell yourself that you're sitting alone, in the deep, deep forest. Cut away all your commitments and concerns. Don't think about the group or about anyone at all. Thoughts of what's good, what's bad, what you have or what you lack, you don't have to think them. Think just about what's in your body and establish your mindfulness exclusively on the breath. Or you can tell yourself that you're sitting face to face with the Buddha, so that you have to keep careful watch over the manners of the mind. Don't let it fidget around, picking its ears and nose, or scratching itself here and there. Keep the body straight and the mind focused steadily on the Buddha i.e. exclusively on your meditation word, Buddha. Be mindful with each and every in and out breath. Don't go slipping off anywhere else. If you aren't genuinely intent on what you're doing, you're deceiving your teacher, deceiving the people around you, and deceiving yourself as well. The deceit here is that you close your eyes and act like you're in concentration, but the mind isn't still like the body. When this is the case, you'll suffer. 
The results of not genuinely being intent are that things sometimes go well, sometimes they don't, sometimes you're aware, sometimes you're not. In other words, the good results you're looking for aren't constant. That's the first result. The second is absent-mindedness. The mind thinks about other people, other things, and doesn't stay with the body, doesn't stay with the present. You're like a person eating a meal. You intend for your hand to put rice in your mouth, but you gaze around absent-mindedly. You think you're eating a spoonful of soup, but it turns out to be a spoonful of pepper sauce. You reach for a sweet butt grab and bite into a clot of dirt or a piece of gravel instead. Or you can make a comparison with a blind person eating a meal. A person with good eyesight sends you your food, telling you that. This is rice. This is curry. This is a sweet. But you don't take note of what she says and so you get them all mixed up. Then you go blaming her for your own absent-mindedness. The third result of not genuinely being intent is forgetfulness. You lose track of your mindfulness, lose track of the breath, lose track of yourself. All three of these results are obstacles to the practice. They're signs of not being sincere in your duties. There are two kinds of knowing, genuine knowing and deceptive knowing. Genuine knowing is what stays right here and now within you, without going anywhere else. You know when you're standing, you know when you're lying down, speaking, thinking, etc. As for deceptive knowing, that's the knowledge going after labels and perceptions. Labels are an act of knowing, but they're not the knowing itself. They're like the shadow of knowing. Genuine knowing is being mindful of the present, seeing causes and effects. This is discernment. For this reason, we should each try to train ourselves to give rise to discernment, the genuine knowing that won't deceive us into falling for a mass of suffering. We do this by training the mind to stay firmly in concentration, by being mindful and circumspect in our breathing. By being alert in our every movement, by being genuinely intent in our duties, and by showing respect for our teachers and for ourselves. These are the factors that will lead us to the happiness and well-being to which we aspire. Intent August 25, 1957 When a person makes up his mind to do one thing but then turns around to do something else entirely, the results of his first intention simply won't come about. A person like this has to be classed as really stupid and ingrate to himself, a traitor to himself. Like a child who says goodbye to its parents, telling them that it's going to school, but then goes wandering off to see a movie or a traveling show. The parents don't know what's going on. They think the child is at school. By the time they've tracked down the truth, they will have wasted a lot of time. In this way, the child harms itself in four ways. 1. There's the bad karma of having deceived its parents. 2. It throws away the money the parents paid for its tuition. 3. It stays ignorant and doesn't pick up any of the knowledge it would have gained at school. And, 4. Death keeps creeping closer day by day, the child itself eventually becomes a parent, and yet it can't even read or write three letters of the alphabet. In the same way, when you aren't really intent on the practice you come and sit here meditating but your mind isn't with the body. It goes wandering off to think about things unrelated to the Dhamma. Thinking about things at home, thinking about your children or grandchildren, thinking about this person or that, thinking about things ahead or behind. Your mind isn't established in stillness. Your eyes are closed but your mind slips off to look for fun with different kinds of preoccupations. Sometimes you meet up with dogs and cats, so you play with the dog and cats when this happens, you harm yourself in the same ways. 1. First, there's the bad karma of deceiving your teacher, telling him you're going to practice concentration but then not doing it. 2. The teacher doesn't know what's going on and so teaches the Dhamma until his mouth runs out of saliva, but with no results to show for it. 3. You yourself stay ignorant. You sit and meditate for three years but don't get anything out of it. If people ask you about the practice, they can't get any sense out of you, which reflects badly on the teacher. 4. When death comes, 
you'll die with pain and hardship, with no inner wealth to take along to the next life. So you'll keep on spinning around in death and rebirth for who knows how many lives, without ever getting to Nibna. All of this comes from not really being intent. If you're really intent on practicing the Dhamma, then no matter what, you'll have to get results large or small depending on the strength of what you can do. If you're going to meditate, be intent on meditating. If you're going to listen to the Dhamma, be intent on listening. If you're going to speak, be intent on speaking. Whatever you do, be intent on what you're doing. That way you'll get the results you want from your actions. To get results, your intent has to be composed of the four bases for success. In other words, one, chanda, like what you're doing. If you're going to meditate, be content to stay mindful of the breath. Two, virya, be persistent and don't get discouraged. Even though there may be pains in the body, you endure them. 3. Siddha, give your full mind to what you're doing. Don't just play around. Don't let your mind wander off to think of other things. 4. Vimans, when you really do the meditation, you contemplate to see what gives rise to a sense of peace and ease in the body and mind. When your meditation is composed of these four factors in full, it's as if you're sitting on a chair with four good legs. You won't have to fear that the chair will start tilting or fall over. This is different from a person who's sitting on a chair with only two legs or one. If anyone happens to brush past, he may tip over or fall flat on his back. But if you're sitting on a chair with four good legs, then even if someone runs into you or grabs hold of the chair to give it a shake, you needn't be afraid of falling off. Even if they pick up the chair and move it somewhere else, you'll still be able to sit on it in comfort. You don't have fear any danger at all. This is what it's like when you make your mind fully solid and strong in the goodness of what you're doing. You can sit and lie down in ease. Whether you're in the monastery or at home, you can live at your ease. You can eat or go without food and still be at ease. You can handle a lot of work or only a little and still be at ease. You can have 10 million billions in money or not even a single red cent and still be at ease. When death comes, you can die with ease, free from suffering or hardship. When anyone can do this, the devas clap their hands in joy. When anyone can't, the devas screw up their faces, Walmra and his gang laugh and clap their hands because they beat another of the Buddha's disciples. Think about it, do you really want to be one of Mra's disciples? We have to use skillfulness and merit to polish ourselves until we're shining and bright. In other words, we polish our actions with virtue, concentration, and discernment. When you train your mind with concentration until it's fully tempered and strong, it'll be calm and cool, bright and gleaming like still water in a deep well, or like the stars in the sky. The hindrances won't be able to walk all over you, for the level of the mind will keep growing higher and higher at all times. When it's really up high, it grows cool. Just as when we're sitting here, we don't feel especially cool where we're sitting. But if we go up two or three kilometers off the surface of the earth, we'll feel cold right away. In addition to cooling off, our eyes will be able to see things far, far away. We'll be able to see the condition of human beings and animals, all the dangers and difficulties of life on the world beneath us. We'll start taking these dangers to heart, so that we won't want to come back down again. When we talk about the minds being on a high level, we don't mean that it's high up like an airplane. Simply that the quality of its awareness is heightened through training its concentration and discernment. When this happens, you'll be able to see the causes and effects of everything true and false. You'll see the dangers of wandering on through death and rebirth and gain a sense of disenchantment with birth, aging, illness, and death, seeing them as nothing but pain and trouble. When you see things in this way, you'll lose all hankering for sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, and ideas. You'll be intent solely on developing the heart to gain release from all defilements and mental fermentations so that you won't have to come swimming around through death and rebirth in the world ever again. Loyalty to your meditation
October 22, 1958. While we meditate here on the word Bado, we have to make up our minds that we're going to stay right here with someone venerable. In the same way that we'd be a monk's attendant. We'll follow after him and watch out for him and not run off anywhere else. If we abandon our monk, he's going to abandon us, and we'll be put to all sorts of hardships. As for the monk, he'll be put to hardships as well, as in the story they tell. Once in the time of the Buddha there was a rich money lender couple who had been married a long time but without any children. Both of them really wanted a son who could carry on the family line and receive their inheritance. So they talked the matter over and decided to invite a monk to their home to inform him of their predicament. To see if he could use his meditative powers to help intercede with the deva so that they could have a child. When they had made their decision, they told one of their male servants to go into a nearby forest to invite a meditating monk to come have a meal in their home. The next morning before dawn, the servant got ready to go into the forest to a hut where a meditating monk had taken up residence. Now, this servant had once been a hunter and still had all his old hunting instincts. He had even kept his crossbow and arrows and other hunting equipment, and maintained them in good shape. When his master had sent him to invite the monk, which would require going into the forest, he was happy to go, for it would give him a chance to do a little hunting on the side. So he snuck his crossbow and arrows out of the house under his shirt. When he got halfway to the monk's hut, he realized that it wouldn't be proper to approach a monk while armed, so he decided to hide his weapons on the side of the path. On the way back, he'd be able to pick them up. So he stashed the crossbow and arrows behind a bush near the path. Then he went on his way empty-handed until he came across an old monk sitting in front of a hut. After bowing down to the monk, he said to him, Venerable sir, my master the money lender and his wife have asked me to come invite you to a meal in their house this morning and have told me to take you there. Would you please be so kind as to accept their invitation? The old monk, on hearing this, decided to accept. Now it so happened that he didn't have an attendant of his own, so he had the servant carry his bowl and shoulder bag. Then he picked up his cane and headed out in unsteady steps toward the moneylender's house. As they walked along, he asked the servant, Where is your master's house? How far is it from here? How do you get there? The servant answered all his questions. After they had walked on a little further, the servant remembered the crossbow and arrows hidden behind the bush on the side of the path. The thought occurred to him that he'd like to abandon the old monk, pick up his weapons, and sneak off to do a little hunting in the forest. After all, he told himself, he had already given explicit directions to the old monk, so he'd be able to find his way on his own. Then he came up with a plan. He told the old monk, I've got to go to the bathroom really bad, so let me head into the woods for a moment. You can walk on ahead. When I'm finished I'll catch up with you. The old monk wasn't the least bit suspicious and thought that the servant was telling the truth. So he let the servant go off while he hurried on ahead, afraid that it was getting late and that he wouldn't get to the moneylender's house in time for his meal. As for the servant, he turned off the path and headed for the bush where he had hidden his crossbow and arrows. But before he got there, one of the forest devas decided to test his loyalty to the old monk. So the deva metamorphosed himself into a large golden swan and pretended to have a broken wing. Flying an erratic course under the trees near the path the servant was following. The servant heard the sound of a bird flapping its wings flip-flap, flip-flap and, looking up, saw an enormous golden swan zigzagging back and forth. Looking like it couldn't get away. Seeing this, he got really excited, thinking that he'd have to shoot this bird for food for sure. In his excitement he forgot that he was carrying the monk's bowl and shoulder bag, and thought instead that he had a quiver strapped to his back and a crossbow on his shoulder. So he reached into the shoulder bag and pulled out the old monk's beetle nut crusher, about two feet long, and took aim with it as if it were a crossbow or a rifle. Then he took his stance and pulled back on the crusher, at the same time making the sound of a gun firing, bing, bing, bing. But of course he never hit the bird at all. 
As for the old monk, after walking on a ways he began to forget the servant's directions. So he turned left and right, right and wrong, and couldn't find his way out of the forest. He looked back over his shoulder to see if the servant was catching up with him, but the servant never came. All he could hear was the sound bing, bing, bing echoing through the forest. But no matter how much he called out, there was never any answer. The later it got, the hotter the sun, and the more tired and hungry he got for after all. He was very old so he made up his mind to turn around and retrace his steps, staggering back to his hut. Meanwhile, the servant exhausted from trying to shoot the golden swan without success was ready to give up. So the deva, seeing that he had had enough fun with the servant, pretended to be shot and fell down panting heavily on the path a little ways ahead. Thrilled, the servant came running up to pick up the bird. But just as he bent over to grasp hold of it, it disappeared in a flash. This startled the servant, and suddenly it dawned on him that some forest spirit had been deceiving him. That's when he remembered the old monk. So in his panic he dropped the bowl and shoulder bag and ran away with his arms flailing, all the while calling out to the monk. Help me. Help me. But the monk was nowhere to be found. So the servant hurried straight home and told his master everything that had happened. The money lender was so furious that he punished the servant by making him sleep outside the walls of the house compound and go without food for three days. On top of that, he cut back his daily wage. This story shows the hardships that come when a person isn't loyal to his monk, when he runs away from his responsibilities and abandons his monk. He causes all sorts of problems for himself and for others as well. The old monk had to go without food for a day. Having lost his bowl, shoulder bag, and betel nut crusher, he was forced to search for new requisites. As for the money lender and his wife, they didn't get the things they had hoped for. When you apply this story to the Dhamma, it becomes a lesson worth remembering. If you're not loyal to your meditation object or to yourself. If you forget the breath you're meditating on with Budo, Budo, and let your mind go wandering off in thoughts and concepts. It's as if you've abandoned the monk you're supposed to look after. You don't follow him, you don't act the role of his student as you had intended to. The results that you had hoped for will thus get ruined. In other words, your mind won't get established in concentration. All kinds of hardships the five hindrances will come flowing into the heart, and no peace will appear. This causes you to suffer and to miss out on the good results that you should have achieved. At the same time, you cause hardships to others i.e., the monk sitting up here giving you a dhamma talk. He wastes his time, talking for hours until his rear end hurts. Instead of lying around his hut at his leisure, he has to sit here jabbering away with no results to show for it at all. So keep this story in mind as a lesson in teaching yourself to be intent in doing what's good. Don't be the sort of person who like the servant in the story is disloyal to his monk. There's another story to illustrate the good things that come from being loyal to your monk, which I'll tell to you now. Once there was a money lender couple who had a large mansion in the city of Braz. Both husband and wife were avid merit makers. Every year during the rains retreat they would invite a monk to have his meal in their home each day for the entire three months. Now the money lender couple had a slave couple working in their household. The duty of the slave woman was to pound the rice and separate it into various grades. The highest grade rice was for giving the monk as alms. The second grade rice was for the money lender couple to eat. The third grade rice was for the servants in the household, and the fourth grade the lowest grade rice mixed with bran was for the slave couple to eat themselves. As for the slave woman's husband, his primary duty was to cut firewood in the forest and make the fire for cooking the rice. His secondary duty was to wait at the mansion gate each morning to welcome the monk who would come for the meal. And to carry his bowl and shoulder bag up to the house for him. And if I remember rightly, the monk who was invited for the meal that year was a private Buddha. At any rate, when the monk had finished his meal, the slave would carry his bowl and bag from the front door of the house back out to the mansion gate. As he performed this duty every day, the slave came to develop a strong affection for the monk. 
and the monk felt compassion for the slave. If he had any fruits or other delicacies left from his meal, he would always share them with the slave. This made the slave feel an even greater loyalty toward the monk to the point where the money lender couple allowed him to enter the house as the monk's attendant. One day the slave got to follow the monk all the way into the dining room. Before reaching the dining room, he passed the bedroom, the parlor, and the money lender's private dining room. He got to see all the many beautiful and expensive things decorating the money lender couple's home. On the way out, after the meal, he happened to see the money lender's favorite dog a male eating food from a dish near the door to the dining room. He couldn't help noticing that the dog's food was fine rice with curries, and that the dish was made of silver. He thought to himself, look at all the merit this dog has. It gets to live in the house and doesn't have to run around looking for food on the ground outside like other dogs. When the time comes, someone fixes food for it to eat, and the food looks so delicious. The rice is a higher grade than what my wife and I get to eat. And its dish is a fine one made of silver. If only I could be reborn as a moneylender's dog, just think of how happy I'd be. After he had accompanied the monk to the mansion gate. He went back to his shack and told his wife about all the things he had seen in the moneylender's house. And especially about the dog eating high grade rice and curries from a silver dish. Then he added, neither you nor I have any real happiness or ease in our lives. You're exhausted every day from having to pound the rice. As for me, I have to slash through the forest to find firewood and to make the fire for cooking the rice for everyone in the household. But all we get to eat is the lowest grade rice mixed with bran. We shouldn't have been born as human beings. If only we could be reborn like that money lender's dog. From that day on, the memory of the money lender's dog kept occupying his thoughts. At the same time, though, he still remained loyal to the monk. But just a few days later he had an attack of horrible cramps and died. After he stopped breathing, his spirit didn't go off anywhere. But kept hovering around the money lender's house both because it was still fixated on the dog and because it felt attached to the monk. Every morning it would follow the monk in and out of the house. One day, after offering the monk his meal, the money lender couple presented him with many additional offerings. When he had finished eating, he carried all the offerings out the door where the dog was lying on guard. Seeing the monk with his arms all full of things. The dog thought that he had stolen them from the money lender couple. So it rushed at him and started to bark. The spirit of the slave, hovering behind the monk, slipped right into the dog's open mouth and into its stomach and then couldn't get out. So now it was stuck. It couldn't follow the monk in and out of the house as it had every morning. Instead it could only stir around restlessly in the dog's stomach, which of course had an effect on the dog's behavior. It couldn't lie still, and kept getting into places it didn't belong. The money lender couple noticed it acting abnormally and, mystified, had one of their servants put it outside in a pen with the other dogs of the household. Before too long, the dog mated with a female, and the female became pregnant. And so now the slave was reborn as a puppy in the female's womb. While it was in the womb, it still wanted to follow the monk in and out of the house, but it couldn't get out. All it could do was thrash around in its mother's womb, causing her all sorts of misery and pain. When her time came, the female finally gave birth to a male puppy much larger and stronger than normal. This was because the puppy's consciousness had such a strong desire to get out and see the monk all along. As soon as it was born, it opened its eyes wide and started to run because actually it had been running ever since its time in the womb. So the next morning, when it saw the private Buddha come to the mansion gate, it was overjoyed. It ran up and jumped all over him, grabbing his shoulder bag from his hand and running after him all the way into the dining room in the money lender's house. This amazed the money lender couple and made them feel strong affection for it. The next morning happened to be the last day of the rains retreat, which was the final day of the monk's invitation to eat in the money lender couple's home. So before leaving the house after he had finished his meal, the monk said to the money lender couple. Because today is the last day of your invitation, 
I would like to give you my blessing and take my leave to return to the seclusion of my hermitage in the forest. Then he turned to the puppy, tomorrow I won't be coming to your master's home any more now, so I want you to stay here and guard your masters with loyalty. Don't follow me out into the forest, okay? When the puppy heard the private Buddha say this, it was so heartbroken that it dropped dead on the spot. Through the power of its love and loyalty for the private Buddha, it was reborn as a Deva son in heaven, with a large following and many divine treasures. His palace was more lovely than that of anyone else's, his looks more handsome than any other Deva son in heaven. His voice was alluring, his fragrance like that of flowers. Any female Deva who heard his voice or smelled his fragrance wanted to see him. On seeing him, she would want him as her mate. All of this was the result of the goodness of the slave's sincere loyalty to the private Buddha. The only bad part of his story was that moment he got fixated on the money lender's dog, which was why he had to spend one lifetime as a puppy. But because the good kama of his mind was stronger, it was able to wipe out the kama of his animal birth and take him to heaven. This story is another example that you should take to heart in your practice of training the mind. You have to be very, very careful. Don't let any hindrances come in and take over your mind while you're practicing concentration. Don't let your monk run away from you, and don't you abandon your monk to go running after dogs. If your mind doesn't stay with your monk i.e. the factors of your meditation all sorts of troubles will result, as in the stories I've told you here. As for the goodness that comes from keeping track of your monk, it will send you to good states of becoming and birth, and will raise your mind ultimately to the level of the transcendent. Wrong concentration is concentration lacking mindfulness and alertness. Wrong release is when you get beyond distractions by falling asleep. Another form of wrong concentration is when you lose track of your breath and your body. Another form is when you don't lose track of them, but you get deluded as when you get fixated on signs or light, and assume yourself to have gained some special attainment. You fall for these things and hold onto them as being trustworthy and true. In this way, they turn into the corruptions of insight, vipassan pakalisa, and all sorts of skewed perceptions. A pure mind is one that has grown dispassionate toward thoughts of past and future, and has no hankering for any sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, or ideas at all.